microphones on and get rid of the cover page. All right. Praise the Lord. Good evening. Hallelujah. We're going to start the Instagram feed here. So give us just a minute or so to get that up and running. All right. Praise the Lord. Welcome everybody on Facebook, all of uh, our family on Instagram. And um, good to have you with us tonight. Uh, Sunday, we had some visitors. And it, last couple of weeks, we've had some visitors and it's been nice to see new people. And uh, I believe as we continue to get the word out to people and tell them about uh, you that are viewing, tell people about the broadcast. If you're getting blessed, uh, you can tell other people about the blessing and uh, how they can reach us. So I think I've sent each of you a, a card. Uh, I, I think when I send out this month's uh, newsletter, I'll, I'll add another card in there so you can give one to somebody or at least give the information out if you don't have it. But praise God. Good to have you with us. For those of you that don't know who we are or who I am, Pastor Bill Emmons, uh, Covenant Faith Center, Covenant Faith Center Ministry or CFC Ministries International. Uh, 44 years pastoring the church in uh, North LA called uh, Chatsworth, California. And then last year, God uh, had us to relocate to the Tulsa area. And in obedience to what the Lord told us, we've moved here and we're operating our ministry from this location, but we're ministering all over the world. Our viewership has gone from an average of 50 to 75 people per week to, you know, close to 15,000 people per week. And uh, we're believing for 20,000 average. Once we get to 20,000, we'll let it ride for two or three weeks to make sure it's going to continue around that number. Uh, but then we're going to believe God for another 5,000, go up to 25,000. I got big goals. <laughs> That's the way God is. He never stops the creating. So we're going to continue to believe God to increase. Amen. Uh, we're having a beautiful semi-fall week this week. Uh, the trees are actually starting to change color already. Uh, it's cooled down a, a good 10 degrees. Uh, in Last week, we were down in the 80s, mid-80s, I guess it was. And uh, that's really good. But the nights are getting cool. We've been down in the 50s this week at night. So even though it may be warm during the day, uh, that's one of the clues for me that fall has arrived, uh, even if we're not ready for it. But I look at it this way. When football starts, fall starts, the holidays start. You say, what holidays? Well, you know, we got uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's all coming up. Yeah, that's two months, three months away. The moment we have our first preseason football game, I'm into holiday mode. I'm watching Christmas movies, listening to Christmas music. Well, I kind of do that most of the year. <laughs> but um, I really get into the mood, you know. I start thinking about uh, shopping for Christmas and decorating. I'm already looking for Christmas lights. And... Uh, Anyway, so I, I enjoy this time. It's my favorite time from this point all the way through New Year's. Um, are my is my favorite time, and uh, you know I I just enjoy the whole uh, season. Anyway, praise God. Um, we're going to get into the Word tonight. I was just kind of giving people a chance to get tuned in. Uh, we are on. In case you missed it, we are now on thirteen uh, social media platforms. Our latest one is Getter, G-E-T-T-E-R. That's a conservative platform. It does have a, a lot of conservative political stuff on there, as well as me. <laughs> I'm preaching on there. Um, I'm going to be uh, having some political commentary, sharing things that some of you may not know about that's going on in this country. Uh, uh, good stuff, not just the bad stuff. But um, I won't do that on these regular uh, channels because um, they like to censor us by cutting us off. And I'm not going to do that because <clears throat> we minister to people on these channels. So I'll let you know. Uh, Getter is one. I'll probably be putting some things on. I was going to use Rumble, but we don't seem to be getting any response off Rumble. I don't know why. But uh, so pray for response on Rumble. But we've got two or three of those platforms I can put political information on and, and you can go there and get it. I'll let you know, though, when you can do that. 
All right, praise the Lord. The title of tonight's Bible study message is The Power of Your Words. Not just the power of words, which is vital and important because if you don't understand the power of words, you're missing out on a tremendous uh, opportunity to flow in the miracle working creative power of God. Uh, but you've got to go from knowing uh, that there's power in words and there's power in God's word to recognizing, realizing, and manifesting the power, the creative power of God through your own words, his words flowing through you to bring creative things into manifestation. And Pastor Mary shared some things with you Sunday. Uh, I think I followed up with a couple of short testimonies of, of um, the example that God used me to show her how we can pray for things. Uh, I, I prayed for a stereo that went out and it got healed and restored and began to work perfectly after burning up. I uh, prayed for a speedometer that broke and quit working for months, if not a, over a year. And one day it just popped up and started bouncing and came back to life and worked as long as we had that car. Uh, and then Pastor Mary remembered that and the Holy Spirit ministered to her. She went and laid hands on the dryer and the dryer is working today. You know, it's been working uh, for what, a month now? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So. We, we have to understand there's creative power in our own words, but we have to get to the point that we get the revelation. We get our mind renewed to that so we can actually believe that we have that kind of creative power through our own words. Uh, we have to build the faith for it in our hearts through meditating the word of God. And then we've got, get, got to get control of our tongue, the way we've been talking so that we change our words, we change our speech, and we begin to align our conversations with the Word of God. Not that you gotta go around quoting the Word all the time, but you have to begin to understand that uh, the, you're already getting the things you're saying. And if you don't like the way things are, uh, you probably can go back before now and think about the amount of times you've talked negatively about the situation you're dealing with or the negatively about the circumstances that led up to what you're dealing with. Uh, when the Bible says you can have what you say, or, or we that are in this uh, teaching say this, uh, that's not just a saying. It's not just a positive statement. You know, well, you guys are positive this and positive that. No, we're word people. We preach the word. We teach the word. We speak the word. We live the word. When we pray, we pray the word, uh, or we pray according to the word. We, we don't always go around quoting verbatim every scripture, but we take what God said and we put it into a declaration of faith, a confession of faith, a prayer of faith, uh, when we go to the Father. I mean, stop and think about it. If you got an appointment with the president of a corporation and you wanted to give important, vital information that would help that corporation. Um, you would first want to find out what that president, the way he thinks, the way he believes about his business. Uh, you'd want to know what some of his goals and visions are so that you could relate to him. When you go in there, you're not going in cold and, and ignorant of his attitude toward things. You're trying to get a politician to do something, find out what they've been, how they've been voting, what they believe and think and speak. A lot of it you find out by the way they talk. And you want to get them to change something you, before you go sit down with them, find out all that stuff so you know what their thinking is and then go in there with a plan, go in there with uh, the answers. So when we go to God in prayer, uh, we, we go to God with his word. I don't have to wonder if God hears my prayers because the moment I am declaring my prayer as a, uh, a prayer of faith in God's word, what God has said, all right, I know I've got the answer. I may not see it yet, but I know that God hears that. I know the Holy Spirit hears it. I know the ministering angels of God hear it. And, and I know that my body hears it. My, my spirit man hears it. My mind hears it. And that keeps me in faith. All right, so let me let me kind of start out. That was kind of an introduction. 
Uh, sometimes my introductions are a bit long. <laughs> In fact, I, I uh, sometimes think all my past messages are introductions to my current message, you know. All right. Um, God is so committed to his word that he places himself, listen to this, he places himself under the authority of his own word. <laughs> you say, I, yeah, I don't quite understand that. Well, let me read you some scripture here. Psalms 138, verse 2 from the King James translation. I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified, now listen, the psalmist is writing, talking to the Father. He says, thou hast magnified thy word above the, all thy name. Now, I like what he says, all thy name, because uh, God is not his name. I know I'm, I'm over driving this volume here. I'm going to tune it down a little bit. Um, right back here, I have my bookmark that the Holy Spirit had me make. And I think it has 14 of the names of God. So when you read a verse like that, it says, all thy name, it incorporates all those names, all 14 names of God that are listed in the Bible, like things that God calls himself. He says, uh, uh, I am Elohim, almighty God. He says, I am El Elyon, most high God. I'm Jehovah, uh, the Lord of hosts. I am El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. I am Jehovah Jireh, uh, the all-provider. These are all the names of God, and those are meanings of those names. We have 14 of them. Well, the psalmist says that God magnifies his word above all his name. All those names have to be submitted to the word of God. All that God is, is submitted by his will to his word. He's committed. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 through 19, King James translation so that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises for when God may... Now, let me stop there. He said, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And I've shared over the years, you know, that when I first started sharing that, hey, we are people that follow God and inherit the promises. And if we can do it, you can do it. So... We're an example of faith that you can follow. That doesn't boost me up like I'm really somebody important. That's not an egotistical thing. He says, follow those who through faith and patience are inheriting or manifesting the promises of God. Well, we've been doing that for almost 50 years. We've been walking in God's blessings. We've been watching God do miracles in our lives. We've been watching God use us to, uh, to accomplish miracles and healings and answers to prayer in other people's lives. Uh, so we feel like, you know, we're one of those people that um, uh, is somebody that you can follow. And I got to make sure my power is on my monitor here. And uh, you can follow that example that we set. And we're not the only ones. We're not saying we're the only right people. There's other people you can follow. But since you're listening to us, we can set an example for you. All right. Now, the next verse, 13 here, says, um, For when God made a promise, God, lower that volume just a little bit more, hitting red lines there. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, what does that mean, he could swear by no greater? There wasn't any God above him. He could say, well, I swear by God so-and-so, Okay. Uh, he couldn't say, well, I swear by the Bible. He was the word, <laughs> you know. Uh, he couldn't swear, uh, you know, pinky swear. Well, those don't mean anything. Uh, there was nothing greater. There's no, there was no court. There was no uh, judge. There, there was no governance body greater than him. So he swore by himself. Now, let's continue to read. So he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. Verse 14, saying, surely, surely, it's a sure thing. In blessing, I will bless thee, multiplying. I will multiply thee. Now, of course, here he's talking to Abraham. But the Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us, so that the what? The blessings of Abraham might come on us. Amen. 
So when he speaks the blessings to Abraham, he's speaking them to us, isn't he? All right. So God said he will bless us. God said he will multiply us. Now, that multiplication uh, can take on a lot of different meanings uh, to people. It, it can mean children. It can mean grandchildren, great-grandchildren, depending on how long you are in your earthly body. But it can be multiplying. Can be God can multiply you financially. He can multiply your wisdom, your abilities. He can multiply you in business. Uh, I mean, it, it covers so many areas of life. So God is making a promise to Abraham, but to us too. In blessing, he will bless. And you can say it this way. In blessing, he will bless me. And in multiplying, he will multiply me. Praise God. That's how you make it personal. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now that's referencing Abraham. Abraham, the word endured, means to remain firm under pressure in other words, he, he was under pressure, no doubt about it, but without giving in Amen. and without giving up. You cannot be a quitter and win. Amen. You have to be a winner going somewhere to manifest. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, I tried that faith stuff and I've given up on it. It didn't work for me. Well, it didn't work for you because you'd given up on it long before you said you gave up on it. Amen. It works for those who work it. The spiritual principles of the word of God are laws in the sense that they work just like the law of gravity. It works all the time. Now, you may be able to supersede it, you know, when you learn how to fly and you, you have the law of lift and the law of thrust, uh, you know, but if you don't have that, you're submitted to that law of gravity and you can go along and say all you want. I don't believe in laws. I don't believe in that, I, you know, but it's still there. Well, the spiritual laws, you can't see them. You can see the results of them, but they still exist. Whether you like it, don't like it, want it, don't want it, they're there. And you can say, I don't believe in that all you want, but they still work. Like, you can have what you say. Well, you've already been getting it. So how, can, how are you going to stop that? Well, you're going to have to change how you apply the law. You're applying it in ignorance at one point. Now you've got to apply it in wisdom and insight and understanding as you get into the word of God. Amen. Um, so he patiently endured and he obtained the promise. So now Abraham becomes a person that we can follow their example of faith. That's why he's in uh, the book of Hebrews, talked about more than once in Hebrews chapter 11. He talked about it again, we'll read it. <clears throat> but he obtained the promise. When you find people that are obtaining the promises, they're getting results, they're getting answers to prayer. When the devil tries to attack them, they walk out victoriously. Uh, they're not defeated in their mind, their emotions. Uh, they don't let their body control them. They've got, finally gotten control over their body by the power of the Spirit and the Word of God. Uh, those are people that are inheriting the promises. For men verily swear by a greater. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife or end of all discussion. When you go to court and you put up your right hand, and you say, uh, I swear, lay my hand in the Bible, I swear that the oath I'm about to give is true and, and so on and so forth. Well, you're, you're creating an oath with a swearing on the Bible, which is supposed to make you honest. <laughs> Some people, they lie right out, you know, no matter what. But when you swear in the Bible, you swear as a witness, they accept that as truth unless they have evidence to prove you wrong, okay? If they don't have that, then they accept your testimony. You say, well, I was there. I'm an eyewitness. I'm not a second party witness. I, I'm not, it's not hearsay. I saw, I heard, okay? They accept that as a witness. Once you swore, that's the end of, you know, doubt as long as you've got the proof, all right? So, uh, let's see, verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. Now stop there. Uh, in the New Testament, the Bible says that is not the heirs of Abraham by blood or by flesh that are his true heirs. The true heirs of Abraham are the people that are living by faith in the word of God. 
faith in Jesus, the Messiah, faith in the healing power, the redemptive work of Jesus. He says, those are the two children or offspring of God. So that's us. Amen. So more willing to show more abundantly unto the heirs of promise. So he's talking to us, the immutability of his counsel. And he confirmed it with a promise. Now, now, immutability there, I looked it up, and it means unchangeable. It's unchangeableness. It, it cannot be changed. It's written in stone, if you understand that terminology, okay? So he wanted to uh, show the heirs, that's us, the unchangeableness of his counsel or his word and confirmed it with his promise by an oath. So God gave us two things we can count on. Number one, he gave us his word. Number two, he swore by himself. Now, what does that mean? He couldn't swear by anything else. There was nothing to hire. So he had to submit himself to his own word. And what if God were to lie? What if the, you know, he goes against his word and lies to you and said, no, no, that doesn't count this time. He has to submit himself to his own word. Now he's a liar. The Bible says the devil is a father of liars. And by submitting to himself to his word and then lying, he would be submitted to the father of liars. He would no longer be God Almighty. You think he's going to let that happen? No way. All right. So he swore, he gave us his word, and then he swore by an oath that, to verify and guarantee that his word was true. Verse 18, so that by two immutable, unchangeable things, his word and his oath, in which it was impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Say, well, you know, I know what it says in the word, but God, you know, I've had people tell me things like, well, I know what the word says, but God told me. Uh, I had a guy one time um, ask a pastor, if, if I see something that God says in the word, but I feel something else is true, do I go by what's written in the Bible or do I go by what I feel is true? And the pastor said, no, no, you got to go by what you feel is true, what you feel is right. Totally, <laughs> totally doing away with the guarantee of God's word. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not criticizing. I'm using an example. I've heard people tell me personally, well, I know what the Bible says, but, and, and the moment you hear that, the next thing is going to be unbelief. Mm -hmm. But you don't understand my situation. It's kind of like they're saying, but I'm special. It's going to take more than just the, the word of God, the promise of God to get me healed or to solve my problem. It's going to take divine intervention. Well, God has already divinely intervened. Here it is right here. You can't get any stronger than this and the Holy Spirit to back this up. Where are you going to go for something greater? I'm going to preach tonight. <laughs> I have so much fun teaching and preaching. I'll tell you, there's nothing better than this. Uh, it's great having a great wife, but as much as I love her and I appreciate her, I value, and she does too, value the word above all else because the word gives us life. It's because of the word of God that we are married today. It's because of the word of God that we love each other as much, if not more than we did when we first got married. You know, when you first get married, you got a lot of emotion going on. Uh, there's a lot of passion, a lot of uh, physical desire. Uh, all that, you know, as time goes on, has to be superseded about things that aren't so variable. And, uh, you know, we've been together for 51 years. I look at her, <laughs> fair <or> five. <laughs> it changes every year, you know. Anyway, 51 years, and we live, love each other more, I think, today than we ever have. Uh, the other day, Pastor Mary, we were talking. She says, I really enjoy being around you. I thought, well, that's nice. She enjoys being around. I, and I said, I enjoy being around you too. You know, we have fun together. We play together. We do things together. Uh, we, we like doing stuff together. We go places together. We, you know, we find things that we both can enjoy and we go do it, you know. But 
<laughs> say, well, what's that got to do with what you, what you were talking about? Well, we base our relationship on what God said. And, and the things that we do to strengthen our marriage are based upon what the word says. And as we do what the word says in relation to each other, our relationship gets stronger, not weaker. It doesn't fade out. We, we've got the same, uh, if I can use the word desire, not in a bad term, but you know, we desire each other as much today as we ever have. I desire to be around my wife. I don't like being away from her. She says the same thing toward me. So that grows as time goes by because we've based our relationship on the word. Well, if you are based, whatever you're dealing with on the word of God, begin to correct your speech so that you are verbally agreeing with what God said regarding whatever you're dealing with, you would begin to see things change. Amen. All right, so verse 18, let me say it again. So that by two immutable or unchangeable things, his word and his oath in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, which means comfort and confidence, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope. The word hope there is confident and favorable expectation. I have a confident expectation of good things to come and that what's going to come is favorable toward me. I like that. I, I like, you know, when God says that, it's, it's like, well, I can trust God. Uh, uh, the, the Bible, I'm trying to think of a scripture that I've, I've been confessing. Um, let's see. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the promise of God. That's not just a good confession. That's a guarantee. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What Jesus did, that law of the spirit of life was given to me when I got born again. And, and uh, the law of the spirit of life of Christ Jesus has made me free free, spirit, soul, and body from the law of sin and death. I'm not controlled by sin and death has no control over me because of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. Um, that, that Mary, there's a scripture that, and we've talked about it many times, uh, good things to come, good things to come. Um, oh, what is it? Come on, Holy Spirit, give it to me. Uh, exp, uh, Oh, it'll come back. When it comes back, what, Pastor Mary and I or one or the other will get it and we'll, we'll share it with you. Um, we have an expectation of good things to come. Amen? Amen? All right. Now it goes on and says, which hope? Confident, favorable expectation. Oh, the scripture. Uh, it marries in Ezekiel and Zechariah. God says, I know the thoughts and plans I have for you thoughts and plans for good and not for evil, to prosper you and give you a good outcome. That's a great promise. But that's not just an empty promise. That's, that's a guarantee. That's part of the blessing. Amen. So he wants to prosper us. He wants to give us a good outcome. And that's God's thoughts and plans for us, to prosper us spirit, soul, and body and give us a good outcome. In other words, when we get to the end of our life, whether we lay down our body and go to heaven or whether we are caught up in the rapture, that we can look back on our life and, and understand we get, we had a good outcome. We had, you know, I, I look at, I got an itch right now. And I'm sorry I have to rub my nose so much, but there's just, in the name of Jesus, I'm redeemed from that. Uh, we've got five kids, five children serving God. They love the Lord. Um, we have, uh, you know, four that have gone, well, two to Oral Roberts University, two to Rama Bible School, Bible College. And then our oldest is coming back, him and his wife. They're going to explore uh, three different Bible schools, Rama, uh, Kenneth Copeland Bible College, and uh, Karis in Denver. And they're planning on going to Bible school, and they feel that God's called to the ministry. I look at that, uh, how many families, now I know a lot of you that are believers, you have the same thing. But how many families do you know who have rebellious kids who are off doing things that are hurting their lives, making unwise decisions or grandkids? We've got 11 grandkids. And well, I'll tell you what, they're so blessed. And, and to 
hear that they're serving God. And, you know, that's just, that's a blessing. And, and you know, if we're here long enough uh, before the rapture takes place and any of our grandkids end up getting married and having children, they'll make us grandparents, not just that no, they make us great grandparents. We're already grandparents. Hallelujah. But I expect that all my offspring will serve God all the days of their lives. I expect that because God declares certain promises regarding your family. That's the promises he talked about with Abraham. All right. So verse 19, for which hope, confident, favorable expectation, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Now that those word, that wording may not uh, clarify it much for you. That's King James. So let me read it out of a couple of different translations. I think I'm going to read it out of three others. So Hebrews 6, 19, just that verse out of the Amplified Bible. Now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. It cannot slip. The hope cannot slip and it cannot break down under whosoever steps out upon it, a hope that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of the presence of God within the veil. Now we're getting a little more clarification on it. Let's go to the Passion Translation. We have this certain hope, <clears throat> like a strong, unbreakable anchor, holding our souls to God himself, our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat, which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold. Well, the mercy seat is the throne of God. That's where he sits. That anchor of hope is fastened to that. So our hope, because of the promises of God, take us a direct line connection to the mercy seat of God. That's why the Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace, God says to obtain and obtain, not to, but and obtain help and mercy in time of need. Now that ought to give you hope is you can obtain help and mercy when you have a need. But you know, you need to know what God says. You need to know what the word says. When you go to God, again, like going to the bank president or going to uh, some, um, some governmental uh, person trying to get them to look at things your way, you, you got to study about who, what they believe and what they think before you go in. So you're talking on the same plane. Well, when we talk about going into the presence of God, we want to know what the word says. See, because that's what God has already declared. And once I know what God has declared, I can go to God on the basis of his own promises that he swore by himself to uphold. And I can say, Father, you said, and because you said it, I believe it and I declare it is mine in the name of Jesus. And God will never argue with you about that. He said, put me in remembrance of my word. You know, that wasn't, he didn't say that because he kept forgetting. <laughs> he doesn't forget. He said it so we would remember and we would then bring his word back to him. He said his word won't return void without accomplishing what he's purposed it to do. So when I take his word on healing or on provision or on protection, whatever it might be, I take it to God in prayer. And I say, Father, your word says, in other words, you said, and I declare what his word says. And now I'm talking on his level because that's his own word, which he swore by himself to uphold. And I say, Father, I, I am now coming before you. And I declare, according to your word, that I believe that I received this because you said it, and you swore to it. Right. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, Hebrews 6, 19, from the pra Passion Translation. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat, which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold. That sounds a lot like uh, the Amplified Bible. Let's go to Hebrews. Now, this time I want to read a couple more verses. Let's start at verse 18 uh, in the message translation. All right. 
Hebrews 6, 18. God can't break his word. Now, this is the message translation. And because his word cannot change, the promise is, is uh, likewise unchangeable. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It is an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. Oh, I like that. Reaching past all appearances, right to the very presence of God, where Jesus, this is verse 20, running on ahead of us, has taken up his permanent post as high priest, turn the page, <laughs> high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. So what is that? That adds another insight. Jesus went on before us. He's seated at the right hand of God, the Bible says, ever to make intercession for us. So he's there. And when we come before the throne of grace to obtain help and mercy, we're going to obtain help and mercy because Jesus is there on our behalf. And whatever we're messing up and the way we approach and the way we speak things, and <laughs> Jesus is there to help correct it. The Holy Spirit there is, is there to help correct it. So that with them working on our behalf, the Father is able to release his glory the manifestation of his presence, the manifestation of his nature back into our lives. Hallelujah. This is good. Amen. All right. Now, let me take it a step further. We've still got a few minutes. Think about this statement. We need to become just as committed to our own words as God has been committed to his word. Now, let's start with a very simple uh plan or idea. When you say, I will be there at seven o'clock. If God said he'd be there at seven o'clock, he'd be there. Seven o'clock, he'd be there already. All right. We as Christians, I think too many times we fail to live up to our word. Not consciously, but lazily. We get lazy about it. Mm -hmm. What time does church start? Well, the average church starts at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. And what time do you all walk in? <laughs> I mean, I, I, as pastoring all these years, I can tell you there's not a week in 40, well, 45 years. Now, we, counting even our, our services now online, there's not a week, not a service that goes by that people don't tune in late or people didn't show up to church late. No, not everybody. Just like, you know, you're here, but there's some people that won't tune in until we're almost done. There's some people that won't tune in at all tonight. They'll tune in tomorrow, the next day, or down the road a few weeks or whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, there's, there's maybe some reasons why that's not like on Sunday morning. If you have a home church uh, and you're living in uh, on the West Coast, uh, you'd be in church at the time we're doing our Sunday morning service, which is uh, 10 o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time, but it's noon here in the central uh, central time. <clears throat> but how many people that, uh, you know, go to church come in late? You know, it starts at 10 o'clock. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's okay. You know, that's only singing. Uh, singing, <laughs> praise and worship opens the gates leads us into the presence of God. Why do we ignore that like it's not important? That's why Sunday morning we have worship uh, in our Sunday morning service here online because that helps you. And if you're here on time on Sunday mornings uh, and you're tuned in uh, and you start at the beginning and don't just run through till you see me uh, getting ready to preach, that helps get you tuned in, get your mind focused Get your thoughts off all the junk out there that you've been having to deal with. You get focused on God. You get focused on his blessings upon your life. I like to have a, a praise and worship song where we're praising God and thanking him, uh, but then a worship song where we're just worshiping the Father for who he is. 
And that's why, you know, we, we, we do it that way. But the point is, how many times have you given your word to somebody? And they say, well, I didn't give my word. I just said I'd be there at a certain time. Now, you, the moment you did that, you gave your word. Well, you know, I have an appointment. I will be there at such and such a time. Well, we've learned over the years to not only keep our word and be there, but to be there early. Let's get there a little bit early before it's time to be there. And uh, because we are interested in why we're going to where we're going, you know. But, you know, that's a, you've got to develop that attitude about all things. I have decided, and, and this is where you have to make the decision, to be a person of my word, to submit myself to my word. You, you understand what I'm saying? How can you be like God if you won't do what God did? God gave his word and then he kept his promise. When you give your word, that's a promise. Keep it. Amen. All right. Now, Mark 11, and a lot of these scriptures we've read and we've talked about words for oh, weeks, if not months now, because words are some of the most powerful things we've got. It's the only thing in, a, in the, the uh, uh, armor of God. It's the only weapon. The only offensive weapon we've got is our words, rhema. That's the sword of the spirit. So how important is that one weapon that we've got? And it's so powerful, we didn't need any more weapons. <laughs> Why didn't he give us the spear of the spirit? Why didn't he give us the gun of the spirit? <laughs> you know, sounds a little silly. But he gave us the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema or the spoken word of God spoken out of your mouth. It's the most powerful thing we got. He gave us the most powerful thing, and yet we turn around and use words indiscriminately. Well, you know, I, I just, you know, I just uh, kind of feeling a little sickly today, you know, and feel down a little bit, you know. People say, how you doing? Well, it could be better. That's not what the word says. So you, you got to stop and think about before you open your mouth, what do I, what should I say in relation to the question? How am I doing? I, I, for, I've developed this habit when people say, how you doing today? I'm great, man. I'm blessed. I'm alive. I'm breathing. I'm blessed of God. You know, and if I, if I see there's no people in line, I can talk to the person like in the store or something. I give my testimony about the dying and being raised from the dead. I, I, every chance I get, you can ask Pastor Mary. If I, if I go to the store and I'm gone a little too long, she knows I've been sharing my testimony with somebody. <laughs> Why? Because there's an anointing on that. There is a witness of the glory of God, the miracle power of God. Amen? All right. Mark eleven twenty two through 24 from the King James translation. And Jesus answering saith unto them, <clears throat> have the faith of God. So stop there. I know in your King James translation, it says have faith in God. That is not what it's talking about. It's talking about God's faith. Have God's faith literally is what it means. God is telling you to have his faith. Well, how do you get God's faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word, the rhema. As you speak, you meditate the word of God and declare it out of your mouth, you are going to build faith. You'll build it faster than just sitting in church listening to the preacher you need both. You need the preacher because they're going to give you the initial word, going to get, build your faith a little bit. And then they're there to minister to you, to counsel, pray, uh, intercede for you, teach you the word and so forth. But it's when you take that word and you begin to declare it over your situation that faith really starts getting involved. It starts building and growing inside you so that at some point, when it's gotten to the point, it's ready to overflow. The next time you say, by his stripes, I was healed, therefore I am healed. Boy, out comes that faith power being released because you've been building it, building it, building it. And now you got something to work with. The Bible says, now the good treasure, the good deposit that you put in your spirit will come forth good things from the word you speak. You put it in. And it comes out of your mouth in words. You know, there was an old thing back when computers were first coming on the scene. Uh, people talk about, you know, when they've had a problem with their computer and they start questioning, well, what did you type? What did you touch? What button did you put in? And they have a saying that says, garbage in, garbage out. 
You type in the wrong things, out will come the wrong things. If you do any word processing, I do my notes on my iPad. And uh, if I don't check it, it's amazing how many words I've created <laughs> that aren't in the dictionary. <laughs> I'm going down there and read it. What in the world is that word and what does it mean? I know that doesn't mean what I thought I was saying. And then I have to go back and figure out what it was I was saying so that I can change to the correct word. Garbage in. All you can do is feed back to me the whatever I put in. Well, your spirit man is the same way. Whatever you feed into your spirit is all that's going to come out. So you got to feed on the word of God if faith is going to come out. You got to feed. And, you know, get past this thing of living in the Old Testament. We're not living in the Old Testament anymore. We live in the new covenant with new and better promises. Yes, we can learn from the Old Testament. We don't live there. Get out of the legalism. What, what just went off? Um, it's not turned on. It's not plugged in under. Is that switch on? You see the, red, the light on? Mm -hmm. See if that plug is plugged in. It may be laying on the floor there. <laughs> I'll let her deal with that. I just lost one of my lights. They only have a certain battery power in them if they're not fully charged. Anyway, so that will get fixed and uh, we'll get our light back on. So what was I saying? What's going to come out, particularly under pressure, is what you put in. So you got to stop and think about what you're putting in with the words you're speaking. It's a fairly good size little plug there. They're all plugged in. They're all plugged in? Mm hmm. Hmm. Check and see if it's plugged in up there. Is it plugged in up there? There's no cord. Okay, follow that cord all the way to the end of it and plug it in. <laughs> we failed to connect a cord tonight. It's all right. It's, it'll work. Um, so verse 23 says, after he said, have God's faith. I just told you how. He said, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall, are you whosoever? Sure you are. Whosoever shall say words unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. It's a key word. There we go. Back on. Got our light back. Shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall, sure thing, shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, stop there. He said, you can speak to this mountain. Now, he's talking about a literal mountain. I mean, he spoke to the wind and the waves. He spoke to fig trees. He spoke to water that turned to wine. He spoke to fish and gold. Uh, he spoke to uh, leprosy. Um, I mean, you just kind of go through and look at all the things Jesus spoke to. He didn't let the circumstance or even the object be part of the problem. He took dominion and he took authority over it and declared the end result. Amen. Amen. That's what we've got to do. So he said, have this mountain cast in the sea. Now shall doubt not in his heart, but shall believe. How do you get rid of the doubt? You got to meditate the word of God and build faith. How do you get, how do you get to the point you believe your words are powerful? You believe your words are going to come to pass. You got to meditate on those scriptures to talk about that. You got to meditate on the scriptures that are scriptures of faith for healing, for finances, for a better job, whatever it might be. And when you, when you start doing that, you get to the point through the renewing of the mind, as you meditate the word, it will renew your mind. And then it will build faith in your heart. When you get your mind renewed and your heart filled with faith, and then your words and your actions, you got all parts of your man, uh, your mind, your will, your emotions, your body, your spirit, man, all of the different components are working together in unison. And that's a beautiful thing because that's where miracles take place. Amen. I, uh, I, I grew up around music. My, my mother was a musician, singer, um, songwriter to a degree. <clears throat> she led worship in every church we were ever in growing up, put choirs together, cantatas, plays, you know. Uh, so I was around that all my life. And then when I got to junior high school, uh, one of the choices I had uh, 
for uh, you know one of the free classes um, outside of your standard things that you have to have. It's called an elective. Uh, was uh, music, and I wanted to play an instrument. No, I grew up around that, but nobody ever taught me anything. So I said, "Well, I want to play the guitar." And they said, "Well, we don't have guitar, but we do have bass, and we have an orchestra, and we have a band." And I said, "I'll take both." <laughs> so I started out in junior high school. I was in both the orchestra and the band, and literally within weeks, I went from fourth chair up to first chair. Now, if you if you've never been in a group like that, you may not understand that. But you start out at the lowest point when you're brand new. When you start learning and increasing in knowledge and ability, uh, we had then a chance to challenge the person ahead of us. And we would both play the same uh, piece of music. And then the, the teacher and the, the rest of the class would then vote on who would did it better. And you get one chance at it, you know, up per week. And if you messed up, you get to try it again next week. Um, but I progressed up very rapidly until I was first chair playing the bass. Now, in uh, the orchestra, it was primarily the bass fiddle. In other words, I had a big bow, you know. And then when I got into the band, I got to start doing the plucking and a little more, you know, jazz. Uh, jazz may not be the right word, but a little more spunk to it. Anyway, I went on and, uh, and got into high school played in the band, played in the orchestra. Uh, friends of mine, we got together and we started our own band and we did, uh, we went to dances, we played the music for dances. And, uh, you know, pretty cool. We thought, well, we're gonna be musicians, you know. Well, uh, there came a, a time in our uh, life that we began to go different directions. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, like most people, found myself having to do other things in life that didn't allow me the time or the, the opportunity to continue my music training. But, uh, and I, I said all that because when we talk about uh, growing in faith, growing in faith ability, it takes, and if I can say a term we used, and we used it in sports, I've, I've been in sports all my life. Uh, practice and repetition, practice and repetition over and over again. When you play music, uh, Mary, Mary, can you even count how many times you've had to play the same songs over and over and over again? You can't count because you do it so many times. Why? To get it in you, first of all, to perfect it so that when you want to play, it comes out. You don't have to sit there with her. She plays the piano. She don't have to sit there and think too much about where her fingers go. She's learned the keyboard. Now she's got to a point, some of the songs she's learned, she, she knows exactly what to do, where to go, and yet she's still out there practicing. And I hear, every time I hear her practice, I can hear some of the same songs over and over and over again. Why? She's perfecting that. Well, we do the same thing with the Word of God. At least we ought to. We, we spend the time meditating it. We spend the time practicing the Word by putting it into action, acting on it. That's why James says, be a doer of the Word. That's why every time God in the Word talks about meditating the Word, he, he couples it to doing the Word. Meditate and do. Meditate and do. So we put that in that practice. You, you say, well, I tried that and it didn't work. Well, you don't quit. First time I played the bass and, and I thought I knew a piece of music, I started playing and I didn't know it. I started taking guitar lessons a few uh, years ago. First time the instructor asked me to uh, to stand up in front of everybody and and play a piece, my mind went blank. Why? Because I hadn't been practicing. I hadn't been feeding enough into me. I thought I was because when I was home, man, I could play really good. I got in front of people and, and my mind got distracted and it couldn't come out. Well, I had to work on that too. We do the same principles with the Word of God. We feed on it, we meditate on it, we practice it by doing it, acting upon it. The Bible says faith without corresponding actions is dead, ineffective. So you've got to begin to act out what the Word says in your life. Amen. Matthew, well, let me read verse 24 there, Matthew 11. Uh, therefore, I say unto you, therefore, because of verses 22 and 23, 
verse 24. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever. Well, you're not underlying soever. It doesn't matter what the thing is. So ever, what things soever you desire, when gives you a time frame, you pray. So when is when you pray? It's always right now. It's not back yesterday and it's not down the road. It's right now. I'm not going to believe I receive, you know, somewhere, some other time. He says, when you pray, believe, basically it's telling us, uh, uh, I'm reading the wrong verse here. What things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. When? When I pray. And you shall have them. It's a sure thing. How do I get to the point of believing? I'm going to spend the time meditating on the word. Till the belief rises up. My mind is renewed and I can, in my mind, I can accept that I can do this. Pastor Mary and I have been working a lot more on the, the power of our words. You can have what you say. We're very stingy with words in one respect that we don't just talk arbitrary words. We don't talk what we feel. We don't talk what we see. We, we've made the decision for almost 50 years now that our conversation will be ordered to agree with the word of God. And we're still practicing that. But you know what? We're getting stronger as we go because we continue to practice it. Amen. All right, let me finish this up tonight with uh, Matthew 17, verse 20 from the King James translation. If you have faith, now we know how to get faith, as a grain of mustard seed. People say, well, I guess I don't have enough faith. I guess my faith isn't strong enough. All you need is the same amount of faith it took to get you born again. Didn't take much. It's just as easy to get healed as it is, as it was for you to get saved. It's as easy for you to believe God for finances or a better job or whatever it is you need as it was for you to believe to get saved. Mm -hmm. The getting born again is the most miraculous thing there is to go from spiritual death to spiritual life. If you had enough faith to do that, you got enough faith to get anything done. Hallelujah. All right. If you had faith as green and mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall what? It shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible to you. So all things are possible to them that believe, the Bible says. This is, this is so good. I wish I could hear you. I was talking to somebody uh, this past week about doing a Zoom uh, program. No, no, no. Yeah, we're not an hour yet. Uh, doing a Zoom program, you know, where, where we all get on together and we talk about things and share things. You ask questions, I give answers, and we pray together and stuff. I'm thinking about doing that. We probably, with the amount of people that watch live, we can probably handle that. Um, but we're, we're working toward getting that. So you can get on, we can get together and talk and see each other face to face, so to speak. Amen. So uh, that's going to be good when we can, we can do things like that. Amen. Um, now, let me just share this. I'm going to put a screen up over my face. Well, those of you on Instagram, unfortunately, can't show you the screen because um, I don't yet have that ability to, uh, to bring that feed through my editor here. But when that happens, we'll do it. But, uh, you know, if you are blessed by this ministry and God hasn't spoken to you yet about being involved in supporting this ministry, uh, I just want to share with you how to do that. Now, all of you on Instagram... Uh, because we're running out of time with you, you can go to my Facebook page and get this information. So we'll see you guys Sunday morning. Be Jasmine happy. was out here. Jasmine was out Hey, pray, pray to God. Jasmine, our daughter-in-law. Amen. So those of you that um, say, well, I'd like to support, but I don't know what I can do. Well, just ask God. That's all you got to do. Uh, we're not demanding anything. We're not asking you to do something that's going to break the bank. You know, we're looking for people who want to support this ministry particularly partners, if people that will be faithful and support on a monthly basis. Um, anyway, on the screen, you can see uh, CFC. If you make out a check or money order, make it out to CFC. Post Office Box 141074, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma 74014. If you have PayPal account, you see our email there. That's our regular email. You can contact us through that. But you can go to PayPal, and that'll give you access 
to our uh, page or whatever you call it in PayPal. And on this, I think it's the second page, once you get in there and start uh, entering your, uh, how much you're going to give, uh, it'll give you the option of friends and family. Choose the friends and family option because not only are we friends, but we are family in God. That'll save about four point something percent in fees that they would take out otherwise. If you have a Venmo account, by the way, you can download these, they're free of charge, so you can actually get these uh, apps. So Venmo is an app. You go to Venmo, you type in the at symbol, and then william emmons 10 just like you see on the screen. Make sure you put the dash in between, you capitalize the first letter of both my names, and that'll get you to our page on Venmo, and then you follow through with what you're going to do. If you want to give, and the only thing that you can do is give by debit or credit card, and that's fine. Uh, the email you see there on the screen, you can take that and you can email your card information to us, uh, or you can uh, text it to 818-679-7067, and we'll do the same thing with, regardless of which way it comes in. Uh, we'll run the card, and the moment that's approved, we will delete your information so there's nothing there that anybody can get their hands on. Uh, make sure that you put in the whole card number, the three-digit three, the three code on the back. We need the zip code for where your uh, statement goes every month because uh, they won't process it the first time without that. And then, of course, your name, uh, as it is on the card, with the amount. And then we can process that. So, hey, we love you guys. We appreciate you. And we're, we're glad you join in with us tonight. Uh, again, Torsha, uh, I can see you. Yeah, you can see me behind the, the screen uh, cover I put up there. I, I understand that. So we're glad to have you with us. Praise God. Uh, anybody else that's out there watching, share this with people. Get the word out. There's people out there that need to know what we're teaching, need to know what we're all about and what we're ministering. And you can be part of getting them turned on to the things of God. All right, with that, I'm going to let you go. We love you. We'll see you Sunday morning. Be blessed.